Here we go. Welcome everybody to another big idea where we're going to be talking about a few different things involved with healing healthcare and those mystery different kinds of conditions diagnoses. I'm your host, Dr. Jeffrey Hanna at Clear Chiropractic. And I've got a, a bit of an interesting one here for you today. This is actually more of a, a case that I have uh, recently consulted with. And I wanted to share with you some of the, the interesting things about uh, this person's particular case because I think that they are very important for a lot of people who might be experiencing some of these different kinds of issues. You've had the MRIs and everything comes back as, quote, being normal. And yet something is clearly not normal. So here's the, the short of the, uh, the person's history that's been relayed to me. In brief, they were involved in a, a car accident over 10 years ago. And since then, they have effectively been having these weird intermittent neurological symptoms. Dizziness, vertigo, brain fog, lack of clarity in the eyes. So blurriness, different things like that. But they also experience intermittent body weakness. Now, of course, that's going to be concerning because the first thing that we're coming to mind is, oh dear, this person is not having proper blood flow going to or from within their brain. But as we said, the person had MRI scans and everything, quote unquote, has come back as being normal. But what I actually want to share with you, completely de-identified, so you never know who this person is or isn't, but showing and illustrating that just because there may not be the overt signs of pathology on the MRI does not actually mean that everything is okay. So let's jump on over to that so I can show you what's going on. So what I have here are actually these, uh, this person's MRIs. And just to help, you know, orient the, uh, the viewer here in terms of what we're looking at, and don't worry, we're not going to go into all the hardcore anatomy here, but, uh, we're, you know, obviously, you know, dealing with brain up here, and then the neck is going to be appearing down here. That's going to be for both of these views. These were taken as if like vertical slices from the side. And so on this video that I'm going to be showing you over here, we're going to be coming as if from the right side of this person's head and into the inside of their neck. And then this one here, we're going to be coming as if from the left side into the, the inside. And I think it'll make sense in just a, a little bit, but I'll drag the, the cursor here just so I can kind of show you. So what we're basically saying is like, okay, well, here is, for example, this person's ear hole on the right and if you can visualize what we're doing then is we're coming inward like this so this is going to be you know midline spinal structures here so let's start there and what i want to draw your attention to is this big black tube located right here this is going to represent and it's really, there's going to be a couple of structures located here, but this is going to be the internal jugular vein. And then secondarily, there's going to be the internal carotid artery. So the internal jugular vein, when you are lying down, this is the normal um, pathway that's going to be draining deoxygenated blood, lymph flow, all that sort of stuff out of your brain. And then the internal carotid artery, this is what's going to be supplying approximately two-thirds of all of the blood up to your brain. So the big black tubes right through here, this is what we're going to be wanting to pay attention to. And I also want to draw your attention to this little whitish bump located right here with all of these dark stuffs attached to it. The little whitish bump, this is the transverse process of the C1 vertebra. And then this darkish stuff, these are all of the, the muscles that attach into it. And then the white is kind of the, the fatty, you know, tissue that's normally in and around and protecting that particular area. So I'll zoom out again just a little bit. Again, we're coming more to the outside margins here where you can see, all right, you can't really see where that big black tube is at all because it's, it's not located there. And as we start to come in like this, there we go. It starts to get nice and wide. 
Nice and wide, nice and wide. Okay, now it's narrowing down to the point where it's effectively disappearing. Now, why is that? It's because we are no longer looking at the same tube. Remember I said there's two tubes. So the one that's ever so slightly more on the outside, get my mouse cursor like this, that's gonna be your internal jugular vein. So blood flow coming down. And then as we come a little bit more inward like this, we're changing the vessels. Now, the slightly smaller black tube that you see going up, this is going to be the internal carotid artery. Again, supplying approximately two thirds of all the blood up to your brain. So you're seeing it's not quite as big, thick and broad, but you can still see that there is a good clean pathway as it's going up in front of this little whitish bump. So that's what we're seeing on this person's normal right side. Now let's flip over here where we're looking at the left side. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna come from the outside left and we're gonna start coming inward. So we're coming from outside in, from left to right. Okay, good. Here we have that nice big black tube which is gonna be that internal carotid artery draining blood from the brain when you're in that lying down position. And then we're gonna to start to transition over right about, okay, where is the transition occurring? Right about there to the internal carotid artery. So you'll notice that, okay, it's getting narrow and narrow, disappears, and then it transitions over. Now we're looking at the opposite vessel located right there. So this one here, is kind of the equivalent of this one right over here. But now I wanna actually go back and forth a couple of times to show you where the actual issue is. And it's gonna have everything to do with that little white bump located right there. Again, that's the C1 transverse process. And it's gonna be happening on that transition point. So let me find first the individual slices where these veins are the largest. There we go. I'd say that that's about right, located right there. So you can see the big black tubes. These are the veins located right here. And in fairness, it's very common where people have slightly different sized veins on one side to the other. I have a bit of the same thing with my own, you know, blood vessels because I've had MRIs and I've studied, I've seen that. So the fact that, you know, you can see right off the bat that this side here is bigger than this side here, that in and of itself is not necessarily cause for alarm. And this is one of the reasons why oftentimes the things that I'm about to show you can go undiagnosed because they're considered to be uh, anatomical variants. But I wanna show you what's gonna happen when we start to come in just that little bit, okay? So it's starting to narrow right there, okay? It's like there. So you'll see that this one here maintains its relative degree of uniformity while over here, right at that bottom tip of that atlas transverse process, you'll see that there is this indentation phenomenon going on like this. An indentation phenomenon that is not occurring on this side really at all. Yes, a bit of the narrowness, but not that kind of a, an indentation. So what this is illustrating is where that transverse process, that part of the bone, is actually serving as a bit of a mechanical obstruction for the normal drainage pathway of blood flow coming back down to the brain. And I think you can appreciate if you're dealing with plumbing issues of the brain, that can cause a whole bunch of different, you know, weird neurological symptoms. Now I'm transitioning over now towards the internal carotid artery. And here you can see, it's like, yes, it's maintaining a degree of uh, patency, but you see that if I come in just a couple little slices right through here, same thing, there's this little point of narrowness between, and this is actually a slightly different phenomenon, but it has to do with this white glob right there, 
versus this side right here. What this is, is this is a ligament. I'll show you where it is on a slightly different slice. But again, the relative orientation of that atlas transverse process relative to this feature right here, this is causing a point of congestion, a point of narrowness in this person's blood vessels. And that, of course, is not going to be a good thing for circulation to the brain. Here, though, again, I think is probably the, the single best illustration that I could give of it right here. It's where you maintain the width all the way down to the big tube and where you can see that point of narrowness or constriction right here. And again, a lot of times, you know, people from the, the pathology aspect will say, oh, no, 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 there's nothing there. Well, when you consider the nation or the nature of the symptoms that a person may be experiencing, this could very well explain exactly and everything that they have that's going on. Now, I do also want to showcase something else. I'm going to modify this view ever so subtly and slightly. So now what we're doing is we're looking at the mid-slice cut now of this person's brain. Their brain stem located right here, their cerebellum, and then their spinal cord coming down like that between the different levels of the, the vertebra. So now this is a different slice that we're looking from right here. But point is, okay, that this is going to be the area that is receiving and is meant to be draining all of the blood flow that we're seeing is getting a little bit constricted right through here. So this is going to be your posture, your balance, not just in your neck and your head, but everywhere in your body, including your lower back. You've got your vital life centers right here, which regulate blood flow everywhere in your body, your heart rate, your digestive rhythm, your respiratory rate, your reproductive functions, all of that is going to be happening right here. And it's also the filter. So the primary transition point of all the information going up to the brain, all the information coming back down to the body. So if it's not getting normal circulation supply, you can appreciate that these things are going to be affected. In addition to that, if you can see this corner white thing right here, this represents the front part of this person's skull. This here would be the opening and then this area back here, this is the back part of the person's skull. So this is the opening where the brain transitions and becomes the spinal cord. And you might notice that this here, wow, is sitting really, really close to that edge. And this is where you can actually have part of the brain stem start to descend into the canal. And what this is like is this is like trying to take a size 10 foot and fit it into a size eight shoe. You might be able to do it, but it's gonna be smushed. And again, that can produce a lot of different neurological symptoms here. From a medical pathology standpoint, that's not diagnosed commonly unless this part of the brain here is located all the way down here. So we haven't reached that point. However, it still is very likely that we're having some degree of irritation in and through this particular area here. And I can showcase that for you on another view. All right, now these are two more views that I wanna showcase for you here in terms of why I suspect that this was not um, diagnosed. It's because a lot of times when a person's experiencing you know, symptoms that are believed to be associated with the brain, this is the area of study the radiologists don't go and they don't look down to see what's actually happening right through here. So what is this yellow line? This yellow line right here is going to show you how low the slice actually went. And you might be able to see it through there. There's that little white bump located right there where that atlas transverse process is. And this here is this person's left side. So you might be able to see this is where the narrowing is actually happening. In other words, they clipped the anatomy and they missed the obstruction by that much. And this unfortunately is a very common thing that happens with MRIs is they stop literally half of a centimeter, five millimeters too low, excuse me, too high. 
And then if a person's having like a, a neck scan, they'll oftentimes stop at this exact same level. So if the problem is located just that five millimeters higher, same problem, but for the other reason, you can't see it. Now you can still actually see some evidence for it on this particular view here. What's this one? This one is if we are looking bottom up. So this would be the person's left side over here. This is their right side over here. This is where their nose would be. This circle you see here with all the white stuff in it, this is their spinal cord. And then this is the fluid that's around it. So these dark things here, these are the muscles on the back of their neck. This outline that you might be able to see here that I'm kind of encircling like that, that is actually that first vertebra in their neck. Here is that transverse process on the right side. Here is that transverse process on the left side. And now what I want to draw your attention to are going to be, well, a few things here. Number one is if you actually notice these two groups of muscles located on the front of the neck, you might be able to see it's like, okay, wow, there's a lot of asymmetry as you're looking at the orientation of that C1. It seems to be that it's swinging forwards on, guess what, the left side to where you're seeing this from a slightly different viewpoint. And that's what we're seeing evidence from on this particular view over here. But what I want to draw your attention to are going to be three structures. So number one, this dark circle right here to this dark oval right over here. And then number three, it's going to be really a combination, but I'll highlight it's this little white circle right here. So what have we got? Well, this one here, I'll start from outside to inside. This one here is gonna be that internal jugular vein, the big black tube. This one right here, it's gonna be the internal carotid artery, giving blood up to the brain. And this right here, this is a bony attachment and a, a ligament attachment site. Uh, it's known as the stylohyoid uh, process. And if it's ever under constant stress or straining, it can actually start to elongate. So what I want you to get a general sense is A, the general shape of the circle right here, the oval right here, and then the distance between the tip of the atlas transverse process here and that styloid process located right there. Okay, so this is the right side. Now let's come over to the left side where we were suspecting that there could be an issue. So we're looking at the internal carotid artery. Still looks circular and still looks to be about the right size. No issues right there. But when you look at the shape of that internal jugular vein, you will see that it is flattened. It is not this normal big oval shape right here. It is flattened here. And if you look at the relative distance between that atlas transverse process and that styloid process over here, you'll notice that based on this person's individual anatomy, there is not near, not near as much room. And so unfortunately, either A, if this person just so happens to have a misalignment in their upper neck that is going forward on that left side, and it's got a point of narrowness anyway, then there's really nowhere to go. And these important vital life structures here are gonna be compressed, involved in some way or another. Or alternatively, it could be that, you know, this space is actually supposed to be normal like it is over here, but what we are seeing and the reason we're seeing this constriction is because it is evidence that this person actually does have a mechanical misalignment in their neck and that is what the origin of their neurological and neurovascular symptoms is. Now, we can't tell that from MRI scans because that's not what MRI scans are designed to illustrate. Nevertheless, what we can do is we can use the MRI to see, all right, is there a, or are there, is there evidence for a mechanical origin of this person's neurological symptoms? And then what we do is subsequent uh, articular imaging, whether that's with digital articular x-rays or with what's called a cone beam CT. So that way we can identify exactly what's going on that is causing 
this particular vertebrate of misalign in this way that's affecting these centers right here. So I know this is a, a little bit of a, a more high tech um, explanation than I oftentimes give, but I do think even if it is the side by side comparisons where you can see, huh, that one side does not look like that other side when it's pointed out to you because, you know, unless you've studied this stuff, you're never going to be able to identify these things, and that's normal. Um, but gives you the appreciation that these things, unfortunately, can very frequently go underdiagnosed. And this is the importance of imaging. When you see, you know. When you don't see, you guess. And when we're dealing with things as important as the health of your neck, and with the health of your brain, the health of your body, and that vital life information flow, you don't want to be guessing. You want to have a very detailed look at this and be able to figure out, okay, what exactly is going on? Because then how can we address these things in the gentlest, safest, and most precise ways possible that give the best chance for success? So as we're wrapping that up, what is showing on these MRIs, and again, we want to do a little bit further studies to confirm if this is truly the case, is that it seems that that top vertebra in this person's neck has actually shifted forwards on the left side. And as a consequence of that, it's disrupting maybe, yeah, blood flow going up, but more importantly, I would argue blood flow coming back down. And so any movement then that's going to aggravate that, and in this particular case, it's going to be turning the person's head to the right or looking down to their left, most likely is going to make this person experience worsening of their neurological symptoms. Again, whether that's a dizziness, vertigo, or different kinds of motor or brain functions as well, all of that stemming from this undiagnosed and unresolved issue going on in the person's neck. So oftentimes, even though a person's brain MRI may come back as saying, yep, everything is normal, remember that is looking at it from the point of pathology. Good, there's no bleeding, there's no tumors, but that still does not exclude the possibility that what you have is a circumstance that's producing a little bit of narrowness that's decreasing the overall function of how well your brain and body are able to work. Unfortunately, a lot of times these kinds of conditions are not diagnosed until you are dealing with a 70% loss of function. And even then, your body, it's not weak. It's going to find ways of compensating, usually up to the point of around a 50% loss of function. So when people are of the persuasion, oh, I feel fine, there must not be anything wrong with me, that unfortunately is not necessarily the case. And this, I don't know about this particular person's uh, history is if they started experiencing neurological symptoms right off the bat. But I do know this, is I do know that if a person is involved in any kind of head injury, neck injury, or even a tailbone injury, why? Because any slip and fall, it's going to produce a whiplash effect through the body that ultimately is gonna terminate and cause a chain link action and you know a chain is only as strong as its weakest link that's going to affect them most likely in the upper part of the neck and because the upper part of the neck is number one the structure that dictates overall how your body is going to be aligned but also that critical interface between your brain between the rest of your body and then the circulation going to and from we have to make sure that that part is actually properly aligned, moving right, stabilizing and strengthening over a period of time to make sure that a person is not having a decrease in their overall life function that unfortunately can show up months, years, or even decades after an original injury. Because yes, we can still solve the underlying issue, but it does take a little bit longer. Point ultimately being from all of this, if and where you are experiencing any of these kinds of symptoms and you're even questioning is it possible that my neck is affecting my brain function i would argue that the best person that you could properly properly see is a certified upper cervical chiropractor why because we know to look at this area number one it's our bread and butter we understand the dynamics of what's going on in this area how it affects our body structure how it affects our neurological function 
how it affects our brain function, how it affects our life function. But we also know how to look at those additional little details that can make all of the difference when you've had all of the other tests and everything is quote unquote being normal. So what I would recommend you do is go to BlairChiropractic.com where you can find a certified Blair Upper Cervical Chiropractor near you. If of course you're in the uh, Northeast Washington State area, certainly I would be you know, happy to have a chat, help you out as best as I can. But one way or another, I do hope that this video, wherever in the world you so happen to be watching, is gonna give you the realization that there can be more going on than meets the eye, but that there's also hope. That if you can find what those missing pieces of the puzzles are, that you can make a big difference towards improving your overall quality of life. So, as always, a little lengthy, but hope you have enjoyed this video. If you did, we always ask that you like and subscribe to the channel. Why? Because that helps the YouTube algorithms recognize this is important information that people need to know about. Similarly, if you've come across this video and you're thinking, wow, I've got family friends who need to know this information, please do share it with them. And last but certainly not least, again, if you're in the Northeast Washington area, I would be delighted to help you out. So what I'd have you do is go over to my personal website, which is drjeffreyhanna.com, where we've got links to all of these different kinds of videos, all kinds of blog articles we've written about a number of different conditions related to the upper, link, uh, upper neck, and also the ways that you can get in contact with me personally. And if you want to schedule an appointment, what you can do is you can go to clearchirospokane.com, which is the company that I am a part of, or you can call our office direct at 509-315-8166, and we'd be happy to reserve a time to have a chat, have a look, and see what we can do to help you out. This is Dr. Jeffrey Hanna at Clear Chiropractic in Spokane. Get well, live well, stay well. So until next time, take care. Bye now.